Ghost with Cats, Chapter 31 Pandy's Party They watched the first hint of sunrise color the sky over the gulf. Brees packed their few items. He was being very brave. But he was holding tightly to the old tuxedo cat for comfort. He knew he may never see Annie again, but she promised she would pray for him often and never forget him. It was a wonderful and painful feeling to be loved. The tiny brown kitten sat on his shoulder. He would miss cats more than chocolate, he decided. Tall was stronger. His wounds had begun to scar under the strange golden gel as they healed. But he still was in a great deal of pain. Annie helped him onto the flyer. She touched his swollen cheek. Be careful. Collie didn't do this alone. Someone gave her ships and resources, Annie cautioned. I know. Vorn and I will have to figure out who else is against the king, Tall answered. I wish I could go with you. This is the kind of thing I used to do best, she murmured against his shoulder. I know I could help. He breathed in the sweetness of her hair. There was still the slight smell of salt from her swim during the night, even though she took a shower. He wanted her to come more than anything. He wanted her to meet his brothers and cousins and aunt. But Annie must stay here to be safe. He would not be able to bear it if she died. He looked over his head where Tor Vorn was holding Sharon. His cipher was ch tracing Sharon's face with the tips of his fingers, like he was afraid he might forget what she looked like. Tall had never seen his cipher so emotional. They were leaving the females they loved to face an unknown enemy in an undeclared war to save their kingdom. I promise I will return for you as soon as this is ended and I will return Vorn to Sharon. We will have time to be quiet together, to be happy. Time when we are not being chased like prey, Tall vowed. Will you wait for me? Forever, Annie whispered, and looked up at the stars in his eyes. I love you, Tall. She carefully pressed her lips against his. He smiled and gave her a small lick on the forehead. I love you, Annalise. I will return for you soon. Annie cradled the giant cat and kitten as Sharon hugged her. Together they watched their loved ones disappearing into the sunrise. Annie held her tears back. They both knew soon may never come. Boaz and Yuri headed to the other house to hide the battle from two nights earlier before Yuri returned to New York. Meanwhile, Sharon and Annie started driving. They still had a lot to do and a lot of ground to cover. Before noon, Annie and Sharon were at Walt's friend's house on the south side of San Antonio. Her fellow publishing agent was more than willing to protect their most valuable and versatile ghostwriter. Boaz called them from the river house in Matagordia. The state patrol was going door to door, questioning residents about suspicious people in the town over the last few days. He played on his handyman from the rental company, but it's a job, stick, and they left him alone. He would hang around, repair the damaged rentals, and dispose of any evidence before disappearing. The new caretaker of New Moon Springs reported finding the bodies removed, a dozen listening bugs and cameras left behind. Boaz returning to Colorado would be a great risk, so he would go to the East Coast and stay with one of his grandsons for a while. It was time for Annie and Sharon to get caught. The best friends had their stories 
practiced and perfect, the little brown kitten, Bear, attached itself to Pandy, the giant, older, black and white tuxedo cat Reese had taken in. A local vet in San Antonio gave them both clean bills of health and shot papers. For the first time in her life, Annie owned cats. Rule number one for cats, you don't own cats, they own you. She called the management company for, for the Galveston condo and said she would be there tonight since the rental schedule was clear for the next 10 days. She ordered a cake and catering to be delivered. Sharon and Annie went bin shopping on their way to Galveston, using mostly cash but making obvious charges on their credit cards. They both had charges that would show up from vendors in Santa Fe, El Paso, San Antonio, and then finally Houston. They arrived in Galveston, bought a few things, picked up the keys, and settled in for Pandy the Cat's pretend birthday party. Cake and catering were set up on the dining table, balloons were placed all over the living room, and a sign by the stairs directing guests to Pandy Dove's party. All Sharon and Annie needed to do was wait for the federal agents to show up and arrest them in front of a crowd of influential witnesses. But before then, they had a call to make. Together, they Skyped their favorite client. Happy belated New Year's Eve's pop. They chorused together and giggled. Well, if it isn't my two favorite fugitive girls, he smiled in his grandfatherly way. Everybody got home okay? Oh, yes, pops. Are you happy with the release? Sharon asked. The book looks good, selling like mad. I can't wait to throw around the ideas for the next one with this young lady. I understand she has some original plot ideas. I'm sure you'll find them fascinating, Pops, Annie grinned. But truth rarely makes good fiction. They all laughed because it was true. There was a knock. Sharon and Annie looked at the door, then back at the screen, grinning conspiratorially. Right on time, the elderly agent announced, chuckling and giving them a wink. See you girls in D.C. I have a new restoration to pick up tomorrow anyway. Bye, Pops, they chorused. The Skype closed. Rules for Daily Life number three. Pretend to be the person they expect until you can be invisible again. Annie opened the door, doing her best to look shy and timid. Dr. Winters Dove, I'm Special Agent Clayton, Homeland Security. You need to come with us. A tall, thin man in a suit demanded as another glared at her menacingly. But I'm having my cat's birthday party tonight. Can you come back tomorrow? Annie asked quietly. Uh, pardon me? He looked at her like she was a mental patient, and she bit the inside of her cheek not to smile. My cat, Pandy, is turning 20. I'm having a party. Can you come back tomorrow? Annie asked again, blinking at them. I'm Sharon Cohenshine, Annie's publisher. Is there a problem? Sharon introduced herself in an all-business tone. Ma'am, we've been looking for Dr. Winterstub since before Christmas. She needs to come with us. It is a matter of national security. Agent Clayton announced again in a gruff tone. He was trying to be intimidating, but Sharon was having none of it. <clears throat> well, she has been with me since December 10th, when her hotel caught fire outside of Denver. She's been finishing a project for a very important client, so we went on a little road trip to do some shopping therapy. So, whatever you think she did, she was working for me, Sharon declared boldly. Then you need to come with us too, he said. Do you have a warrant? Sharon smiled sweetly. The agent stiffened. Sharon's beautiful smile turned into a knowing smirk. 
That would be a no. She gave him her best scowl. Look, I don't know what kind of game you're playing here, Agent Mud whatever. Clayton, the man corrected. Sharon glared at him, waving her hand dismissively. Clay, mud, same thing. Christmas time is the anniversary of the murder of Annie's parents and another very bad time for her. If you want to call General Paul Fenton at the Pentagon, he'll tell you why Annie is a little fragile at this time of year. So here's my lawyer's card. You fetch the warrant and come back tomorrow. I have a party to finish preparing for, for my best ghost writer's cat. And Sharon slammed the door in his face. Annie stared at her wide-eyed, almost laughing, but Sharon shrugged, declaring, What? He had bad cologne and I have allergies. About 15 minutes later, Sharon's South Texas contacts began showing up. The party was in full swing two hours later, when the special agents showed up again with a pair of federal marshals to arrest Annie and Sharon. However, a former Texas Ranger and retired judge, one of Sharon's authors, was at the party. He was extremely interested in having Annie ghostwriting with him after talking to her for only a few minutes. Judge White demanded the AD Agents let the ladies pack their clothes and cats because the warrant was flimsy and nearly groundless. He escorted them to Hobby Airport, where they were placed on a jet to Washington, D.C. Judge White chewed the agents and marshals about improper extradition across state lines and put a Texas Ranger on the plane with his publisher and her writer. Annie and Sharon graciously thanked him for watching out for them before he was escorted off the bombardier jet. Four hours later, they were in D.C. and being interrogated. The story was, after the fire, Annie almost had a stress breakdown, so she went to her friend's home, where Sharon picked her up. They went to spas or shopped and stayed in rentals or with friends. Poor, fragile Annie couldn't handle large groups of people after the traumatic events of her early life, and they were on a deadline. So Sharon babysat her to get the project done on time. Their records showed they went to Aspen, Trinidad, Santa Fe, El Paso, San Antonio, Houston, and finally Galveston. There were people who could verify it. They didn't know anything about explosions in the desert or three men who could be terrorists or gun battles posted on YouTube that looked like they came from a bad movie or who was at the Matagorda, in Matagorda at her late father's formal beach property because Annie didn't own it anymore. The night passed very slowly. Annie sat on the floor of the interrogation room, holding her old cat and kitten, pretending to be every bit the neurotic cat lady. The men looked at her through the glass. She seemed fragile and small, despite her heavy sweater and loose-cut, bulky blue jeans. I don't know what you think you're doing, General Fenton, or you, Mr. Bentz, but there is no way any judge or jury would believe that woman in there is associated with domestic terrorist. She was a hero almost eight years ago and has been almost a recluse ever since. Unless you can offer some new evidence proving she is involved in some new conspiracy, you have to let her go and her publisher. Their alibis check out. I have a half dozen credible, upstanding citizens who have spent time with her over the last couple of weeks. My client saved the planet. She survived something most people can't even imagine because you screwed up, General, and let a terrorist join the task force she was part of. And if you're trying to tell us 
you can't tell us how you know she may be involved with mysterious forces that may or may not be harmful to our way of life, so you need to keep her indefinitely because he said so? Is that correct? The steel-bearded lawyer scowled as he jerked his head toward Bents. But we need information she has, Bents insisted. What information? The long, young lawyer and the yarmulke demanded. I can't tell you. It's classified, Bents answered. Right. Classified. The young man rolled his eyes. Paul, we are taking our clients now, Mr. Winston said, gladly. And if you keep listening to people like this Bents here, We'll have you in court and on the front page of the New York Times. And I am sure Mr. Levensteel here would love to add this case to his resume of being the youngest graduate from Yale Law. You know we can't lose. And you really need to think about whether or not you want Rabbit Hole revealed to the world. Winston strode out of the observation room and walked into the interrogation room next door. He knelt in front of Annie, who looked surprised for barely a moment when she recognized him. She hadn't seen them since they jumped off the train in Pueblo. Gregory missed Pandy's birthday party, Annie said to hide her surprise. Well, he caught a cold at Pops, and I didn't want Pandy to get sick. Who's the little one? he asked kindly. This is Bear. He had three friends, but they went to another home. She smiled up at him. Winston nodded in understanding. Good for them. Let's go, sweetie. Pops came to give you a ride back to bear country. Mr. Winston, she is not released, Agent Clayton insisted. She is now, son, he growled, unless you want to discuss this on MSNBC or Fox. They rose and Winston helped her put the cats into the cat carrier. In the hall, Sharon was cursing the general about how she was going to sue him and everyone he ever knew. Give us a moment, Annie said firmly to them, then waited until they got to the door. She looked up at General Fenton and said quietly, Y'all need to retire, Paul. Bence lied to you about everything. The general frowned. Annie, how much bigger than Pandora is this? I know you know about the ETs, she blinked once, then an and answered. It's a biblical thing. Aliens, the aliens came before Pandora. Ask Bents about Kali. Goodbye, Paul. She walked out, and she walked away and out into the sunshine with her publisher and their lawyers. The general frowned and signaled his, his assistant. I want to know all of Ben's project audits. I want them on my desk now, and anything to do with a project or person named Polly. The assistant nodded and hurried away. Outside was a classic Bentley and a limo. Yuri, in a suit, was standing by the limo. Annie and Sharon hugged. I'll see y'all in a few weeks, Annie promised. <clears throat> Watch yourself, Sharon said. I'm going to sell everything except Kuchara and go underground. I hear Haifa is nice this time of year. It's spring. Oy vey, no. Nashalom is nicer. Get a house there. Be careful. There is still a wolf on the loose. Sharon got into the limo next to her lawyer, Boaz's eldest grandson. Be careful. Boaz will be close if you need him, Yuri warned quietly. Don't worry. Soon, Bence is going to be too busy protecting his own arse to be chasing me. I hope. See you soon, Yuri. Yuri nodded to Annie and put the cat carrier in the front of the limo before walking around to the driver's side. Winston and Pops were standing by the Bentley. They smiled at Annie as she climbed in the back. The car looks amazing, Pops, Annie declared excitedly. Winston nodded his agreement. Pops smiled at her in the rear mirror, rearview mirror. 
A fan found it for me in an old barn in Romania. But that's another story. Annie giggled. I can't wait to read it. So, how do you know my favorite fellow train rider? Well, once upon a time, two young soldiers did a few things above their pay grade. Pop started conspiratorially as Winston chuckled.